What makes the scariest X-Men comic? Welcome to Comic Book Herald's Crack in Krakoa meets one horrifying moment, a collaborative YouTube day of awesome creators tackling chills, spills, and thrills across a variety of art forms, all curated by CBH fan favorite Matt Draper. Today I'll answer, what's the best horror story in X-Men history? Do the X-Men work well in horror? How does this genre actually fit mutant kind? And connecting past works to the present day X-Men comics, including some mild theories and predictions for what's to come. Hey everybody, I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of comicbookherald.com. Again, you are listening to Crack and Krakoa, number 108, a one horrifying moment special edition. If you want to find more from one horrifying moment and all of the comics and media that is going to be talked about in the horror genre today check out the link to the full playlist in the show notes otherwise if you like the comic book herald youtube channel or cracking Krakoa, please consider liking subscribing and sharing it helps me out a great deal some miler spoilers for discussed x-men comics will follow for my money, the best horror story in X-Men comics history comes in the pages of the New Mutants issues number 18 to number 20 in a 1984 story by writer Chris Claremont, pencils and inks by Bill Sienkiewicz, colors by Glynis Ween, letters Tom Warzakowski, and edits by Ian Senti. The Demon Bear Saga, as we now call it, is an iconic story, perhaps the iconic New Mutant story, kicking off the start of Bill Sienkiewicz's time as artist on the series, which would last approximately two years through 1986, and serving as the inspiration for much of the thorough lambasted New Mutants movie that allegedly came out in 2020, but sadly there's no way to be sure. I'll focus today primarily on what makes Demon Bear tick, transcend and terrify with an eye towards the future of New Mutants. One idea I'm particularly interested in is whether the New Mutants in particular are built for horror better than anything else in X-Men. Even before the iconic Demon Bear saga, surreal, absurdist, and preposterously evocative artist Bill Sienkiewicz had established himself as the go-to architect of horror in the X-Men lineup. First in the pages of Uncanny X-Men number 159 as a fill-in artist, and later in X-Men Annual number 6, a king-size issue, Sienkiewicz is pegged alongside writer Chris Claremont to connect the X-Men to classic horror villain and Marvel Universe staple Count Dracula. To do so, Dracula becomes increasingly obsessed with Aurora Monroe, aka Storm, attempting time and again to make her one of his brides. As you'd expect, Storm ultimately overcomes Dracula's vampiric overtures, but not without plenty of shocking fang fantasies such as Storm devouring Kitty Pride's nubile neck and casting her aside like a broken toy. Effective as they can be, one of the major differences between Sienkiewicz's X-Men and Dracula work and Demon Bear is that Bob, Bob Wysick inks Sienkiewicz in both the X-Men number 159 issue and X-Men Annual, whereas Sienkiewicz inks his own work in Demon Bear. It's no real insult to say Sienkiewicz's unique sensibilities simply hit harder when he has full control over interiors and the inking process, and you lose a bit of that in the pages of the X-Men stories. Of course, another key difference is that Marvel Dracula is inherently not that scary. Sorry, Drac. Gene Colan and Marv Wolfman occasionally work wonders in the 70s Tomb of Dracula, but ultimately those comics are more likely to put me to sleep than they are to keep me up at night. Since then especially, Dracula has more or less morphed into a Marvel Universe supervillain, as seen most recently in the pages of the Dawn of X Wolverine and Jason Aaron and Ed McGuinness's Avengers. And Dracula's a great supervillain to have around, but he's generally pretty far removed from that iconic horror status that actually ch sends chills up your spine. In many ways, this brings us to the primary challenge in telling spine-tingling X-Men stories, and it's that, for my money, the realness of the mutant metaphor, the realness of the hate and fear that drives so many of their stories, is the actual scariest thing about X-Men. I'm innately not that worried about Dracula pulling me into an alley, although to be fair, I overdose on garlic in my recipe so often, it's basically reeking out of my pores at this point, but I am deeply concerned about our world's bigotry, hatred, and small-minded rage. Those concerns feel real. That's why something like X-Men God Loves Man Kills or Days of Future Past resonates so strongly, and if I'm being honest, the realities of an evangelical reverend, reverend William Stryker weaponizing a mob's collective fear and hatred into a frothing congregation of mutant haters is way scarier than anything classically defined within the horror genre. That's part of why I think horror often misses for the X-Men, as the most effective scares are so thoroughly baked into the concept, right? There's a certain uh, realness to X-Men horror that doesn't necessarily need the touch of the supernatural. In New Mutants, Chris Claremont, Bill Sienkiewicz, and the team found a new avenue for spooks, though, one that simply works on a level few had before or since. Truly, if you're perused through the rare Marvel comics that can pull off effective horror, the current ongoing run on Immortal Hulk comes to mind, many of the lessons integrated into the work can be traced back to Demon Bear. 
From the opening page, the tone of terror and palpable suspense is locked in place. From Sienkiewicz's stunning integration of Danny Moonstar's blanket in the face of the bear, to Claremont's atypically restrained opening setup, opening issue number 18 is all looming threat, watching and waiting for the inevitable showdown between Danny and the demon bear that murdered her parents. That tease actually came way back in New Mutants number 3 by co-creators Chris Claremont and Bob McCloud. It's a classic horror movie setup, too, where Professor X, a.k.a. Dad, is out of touch, and it's just the kids at home in the X-Mansion. This is a huge part of why Demon Bear works better in the pages of New Mutants, bringing the terror face-to-face -face with the young squad of teenage mutants coming into their own, disconnected for much of the story from their safety net of their guardian protectors. Even in moments of relative normalcy, such as the New Mutants training in the X-Mansion's danger room, Sienkiewicz and Glynis Ween colors ensure the sharp spike of menacing panels keep the tension high. The use of reds and black space alongside panels literally spilling over to the safety of the school set up a feeling that this demonic presence is invading the comic, gearing up to explode and attack at any moment. Just look at the way here these panels and the all black and the red eyes and red teeth of the bear encroach on the space, encroach on the friendliness and bonding of Danny Moonstar and Ileana and Rasputin. Again, it's a menacing threat that is bursting and sneaking and hiding through the pages of the comic as we read through this effective horror story. Of course, more than anything, I think Demon Bear's strongest trick is how Sienkiewicz sells the unseen. As much as I do quite love the reveal, the idea of a menacing Demon Bear out to get you is significantly scarier when, than one you can actually visualize, measure, and quantify. Even after the Demon Bear is revealed, Sienkiewicz continues to lean into this, letting our imaginations do the heavy lifting trying to decipher the threat of the bear from the mere presence of its fangs and poor Sharon and Tom's screams. There are classic odes to monster movies as well, with Rand Sinclair's transformation into her mutant form coming closer to the raw kinetic energy of werewolves, literally shredding her clothes and inhabiting a wildness and power unique to what we've seen from the innocent young Scott in the book to that point. Again, it's a small detail, it's hardly the focus of the issue, but the way Sienkiewicz depicts a wild-eyed Rain Sinclair with blues pouring out of his mouth as if it's this feral thing, savage, about to dig into whatever surrounds her, the zoom in on the gleaming yellow eye, it all sells the horror of what is otherwise a friendly uh, and known character. Rereading, I was struck too how even the subplots interspersed throughout these three issues of New Mutants, the arrival of Rachel Summers to the X-Mansion, and Warlock's flight from his murderous father the Magus, are steeped in chilling terror. It's certainly arguable whether these keep-the-chains-moving types of subplots, very common during the Claremont era of 80s X-Men and New Mutants, are to the overall benefit of Demon Bear, but they are at least tonally consistent. They fit with what the rest of the story is trying to tell. First, we see a vision of a future from Rachel Summers, a Days of Future past cast off, just coming to Earth-616 for the first time, in which Professor X calls for a military ceasefire at the window of the X-Mansion, and the armed soldiers shoot him anyway. The next instance sets up Hunt of Warlock by the Magus, our introduction to the characters, and a pretty screwed-up father-son story about a dad hunting his child to extinction. Again, note the tonal overlap is on the very same page Danny Moonstar hunts her own demon, this demon bear connected to the death of her own family. It fits quite nicely. Once the demon bear is finally unveiled in full, the magnitude of the threat is impossibly convincing. Danny actually hunts and kills a vicious bear in a danger room exercise prior to walking out into the snowing school grounds to confront the real threat, and the actual demon bear makes Danny's previous training assailant look like his cuddly teddy bear. Sienkiewicz is incredible at larger-than-life figures and selling scope and scale on the page, and demon bear is an all-time great example. Plus, note the use of shadow to create an abyss where the demon's core should be, simultaneously visceral and translucent. The reveal reminds me of the breathtaking grandeur in Shadow of the Colossus, as you're left marveling at the sheer immensity of the challenge to the point it's almost easy to miss a claw swinging with impossible speed in your direction. Sienkiewicz uses this enlarged stature effect across his Marvel work, perhaps most memorably in Daredevil Love and War with Wilson Fisk, the Kingpin, as forever memorialized now was the design influence used in Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Again, it's a use of unbelievable proportions aligned more to the feel of a being's presence rather than their actual plausible physicality. Compare this to modern takes on the Demon Bear, as found in the likes of X-Force Volume 3, the Yost and Kyle run starting in 2008, or Uncanny X-Force Volume 2, written by Sam Humphreys, with guest art by the amazing Adrian Alfona. The first example captures the size, but not the intangibility, the unknowability, of the original. The latter can't help but give in to Fuzzy Was It Was a Bear feels, lacking the menace of the original, ultimately with some intent, as the Demon Bear in this story is turned into Psylocke's pet by the end of, I think, Uncanny X-Force number 6. 
One of the scariest and most infective elements of the original Demon Bearer is how the New Mutants lose horribly and violently in nearly every turn. Danny's an incredible fighter, and yet she stands virtually no chance before being left to die by this creature, bleeding in the snow for her teammates to find. Danny's medical readout is scary as hell too, with the emergency surgery room of the hospital caked in a blood-soaked red ambiance that bodes nothing but ill for the young mutant. It's not enough for Claremont to tell us she barely has a pulse, as the page is drowning in the litany of specifically brutal injuries, fractures, lacerations, trauma, and crushed vertebrae. There's virtually no part of Danny left unscathed from the demon bear's vicious assault. We feel the immensity of the damage that was done to her character, this character we've grown to love. Again, remember, Danny Moonstar is very much the star are an essential figure of the Claremont New Mutants run, and seeing her wounded like this, it's an emotional, emotional impact. It's such a cascade of wounds that New Mutants number 19 opens with a corner box showing Danny hooked up to life support in one of the more memorable corner box visuals from 80s Marvel Comics. It's somewhat deliberately underselling, or I'm somewhat deliberately underselling it because Chris Claremont experiences no shortage of accolades, but his ability to meet the art of the story, which I cannot overstate, is so transformatively distinct from the work of team co-creator Bob McCloud or Sal Buscema that came prior, it's one of the most successful maneuvers across New Mutants in its entirety. In particular, Claremont sells the spirituality and magic of the demon, transporting us to a realm of uneven physics and chaotic laws. As he puts it, there is a moment of absolute madness, of, of their universe, the proper order of things, being turned upside down, inside out, followed by blessed oblivion, right? There's a sense of mystery and magic and chaos and just sort of this dark encroaching evil at the center of it all. In the end, though, it's the blend of the chaos and the absurd that sells the demon bear's malevolence. After the beast shape has come on screen, Sienkiewicz continues toying with fragile boundaries to unveil a monster whose only discernible quality is a desire to puncture you with its enormous claws, and take from you everything you hold dear. The fact that it's revealed in the third and final chapter that the Demon Bear's victims are damaged at the level of their souls makes it an even more potent figure, lashing out at a level we typically assume is unassailable. That the Demon Bear is wreaking all this hell while showing captured victims, including Danny's thought deceased parents as prisoners of its evil aura only adds to the stakes. Note too how even in the final battle, only portions of the beast can fit on screen at any given time, a claw driving through Magma's chest, seemingly killing her, or a paw hovering above Ileana Rasputin, prepared to strike. We rarely see the demon bear in its entirety except for particular standout moments, and this sells the terror of this beast, which seems to be everywhere at once, moving at blinding speed, and again, so unimaginably large. In the end, it's really only through Ileana's own magical connections and the use of her soul sword forged in Limbo that the New Mutants are able to conquer the Demon Bear. There's no real morality play, limited power, of friendship versus isolated evil. Success is granted simply because magic brings her own better sorcery and sword to the party, and the New Mutants more or less get lucky to have her on the team. To my knowledge, it's also the only time in the story where the bear's red, blood-stained aura cools and transmutes to an icy blue as the soul sword cleaves its head in two. For once, the threat of the demon bear stalls, finally at the end of issue number 20, and we do, for all of the horror of the story, get a somewhat happy ending as Danny is reunited with her parents. Looking forward, what does Demon Bear teach us about the role of the New Mutants in the Dawn of X, where we are in current X-Men comics? Well, the actual Demon Bear specifically has been used very sporadically since debuting, so any attempts to literally play a Demon Bear saga sequel are bold claims to legacy that set extremely challenging standards for their, themselves, and, you know, I would anticipate it's a, a fairly unlikely approach to storytelling. I think more broadly, the saga tells us that the New Mutants as a unit simply navigate the realms of horror with an ease and effect that the big capital X X-Men struggle with. So far in the Dawn of X, we haven't really seen this, with Jonathan Hickman taking the team to space and Ed Brisson telling stories more firmly grounded in the hate and fear of humans in this new era of mutant superiority. I'm very much looking forward to Vidal and Rod Rice's run on the title, starting with New Mutants number 14 after the Ten of Swords event, and look forward to what horrors they may have in store for a team that definitely fits better in the horror genre. That's going to do it on this saga of the Demon Bear, but what I want to hear from you, what do you think of this saga? What do you think about its potential for future stories? What do you think about the work of Bill Sienkiewicz as a horror artist of X-Men comics? And I think most specifically, is there a good horror genre fit for the world of mutants that you'd like to see utilized moving forward? Where would you like to see it in the pages of New Mutants? Perhaps a relaunch Generation X? Is there another title that does it better? And of course, most importantly of all, what is your pick? for the scariest X-Men story. I would love to hear it in the comments below. 
Hey, again, I'm Dave. You can find my stuff at comicbookherald.com or patreon.com slash comicbookherald for ways to support. If you like this video or want to see more about what every all these awesome creators are covering in one horrifying moment, please check out the link to the playlist in the show notes. And again, as always, thanks to our mysterious benefactors on patreon.com slash comicbookherald. You can find my stuff at Comic Book Herald pretty much anywhere on social. Look for the best comics ever in my Marvelous Year podcast for more from me. And if you like Kraken Krakoa and Comic Book Herald, it helps me out an awful lot if you could please like and subscribe the video. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And as always, enjoy the comics.